This is the story of an unusual friendship. The friendship between a beaver and a young man named Thomas Hulik. What happened in the wetlands along the river march in Slovakia is a minor miracle. For beavers, as a rule, are shy, nocturnal, and virtually invisible for normal people. Our story tells of the meeting of an obstinate researching student and a stubborn beaver and of their subsequent adventures. This is the River March that once marked the dividing line between Eastern and Western Europe and is now the border between Austria and Slovakia. This railway bridge is a key location in our story, for it stands in the middle of the domain of the Slovakian beavers. Here was once the Iron Curtain. For decades, from both sides, this was the end of the world. Today, Austrian army boats control the European Union's outer frontier. Time and again, they fish exhausted refugees out of the water who have been abandoned here by illegal traffickers. The River March is still a sad frontier, but at least it now stays open. All that remains of the Iron Curtain as a memorial is a few yards of barbed wire. The watchtowers, traps, and self-firing devices have all disappeared. The former death zone is now a leisure park. One fine day in May 1996, Thomas Hulig was walking through the forest as usual. He was a biology student, and the wetlands were his open-air laboratory, one might say. Never before had Thomas found himself in such an unusual situation. I was pretty shaken, but I soon realized that I'd fallen into a beaver lodge. Beavers in Slovakia, I asked myself. I'd always thought the last beaver had been slaughtered over a hundred years ago. From this day on, the young student was obsessed by the idea of finding the beavers. Over and over again, I found tracks of a fully grown beaver. It had come in from Austria. It was the first beaver here on the Slovakian side. I could neither see nor hear it, but I sensed that it was very near. Then, from a distance, Thomas often saw, for just a moment, a silhouette, a tiny movement. Now he was sure. A beaver had indeed settled here in the region, and that was something of a sensation. No beaver had been seen around here for more than 150 years. The sad, stuffed corroboration of this fact can be seen in the Natural History Museum in Bratislava. It was shot in 1858, one of the last of its species. 
For centuries, beavers had been hunted down in Europe with nets, traps, steel clamps, and even fire. They were clubbed, slaughtered, skinned, and eaten. Except for a handful of remnant colonies, the European beaver had been virtually wiped out by the mid-19th century. Some 30 years ago, however, events took a turn for the better. The attempt was made to release beavers in old beaver habitats, above all in the wetlands of eastern Austria. Even though the animals were handled none too gently, the program was a great success. Twenty years later, Thomas Hulick entered on an ordeal. He spent the first of endless days and nights in the wetlands. Summer in this region means immense heat, being eternally bathed in sweat, billions of flies and mosquitoes. Sometimes I could hear it at night. I tried everything to get a photograph of it, but in vain, it was very cautious. What Thomas didn't know was that he was sitting right in the middle of a beaver lady's newly staked out domain. She had indeed come from Austria and now resided in the enchanted wetlands forest surrounding the railway bridge. Even though some pond owners stubbornly maintain that beavers eat fish, they are really strict vegetarians. They eat young leaves and twigs, grass or reeds. And in winter, they make do with bark. These huge rodents are more at home in water than on land. On land, they appear rather clumsy, but in the water, they are elegant, almost noiseless swimmers and can stay under for up to 15 minutes. Wherever beavers settle, they change the shape of the landscape appreciably. They erect dams and canals, build up water and redirect it, step by step, creating a network of connected waterways. Beavers make paths and shortcuts through the undergrowth. They much prefer to stay in the water, though, and remain as unobtrusive as possible when on land. The reason for all this restless building activity is the beaver's desire to be able to reach their main source of food, young shoots of leafy trees, as quickly as possible without leaving the water. One looks in vain, however, for the great beaver dams encountered in Canada or the US. The European beavers prefer to live in well-camouflaged lodges along the river banks. Once again, many months and a hard, unsuccessful winter had passed in the wetlands. Tom not only looked older, he felt it too. And then, one day, early in summer, everything changed. Just as I was beginning to lose hope, I heard noises. I realized that the beaver was now coming out of his lodge during the day as well. It suddenly appeared very close to me.
At last, the long-desired first meeting came about. In full daylight, Tom found himself standing before the mistress of the realm. He would call her Rachel from now on. The Slovakian word is rachla, and it describes the noise of the beaver tail as it slaps the water. It was like a kind of miracle. She seemed to have grown used to me and recognized me from now on by my voice, I suppose. I was deliriously happy. Beavers are principally and constantly occupied with the business of feeding themselves. If only on account of her considerable size, Rachel, the queen of this realm, so to speak, commands respect, for she weighs far in excess of 30 kilos. The male of the species only appears in the mating season. Lady Rachel wears the pants in the beaver world. With her pungent aroma, Rachel has marked out several hectares for her family and her favored mate. Any other beaver daring to approach this reserve is driven off fiercely. She even chases her own young away when they're two years old. Somewhere, Rachel has burrowed a den where she raises her children. But Thomas has yet to catch a glimpse of her. Rachel's domain is tucked away in a quiet backwater of the wetland forest. A few hundred meters downriver, at the foot of the ruined castle of Devin, the march flows into the Danube. On its banks, just a stone's throw away, lies Slovakia's capital, Bratislava. <laughs> it was in Bratislava that Thomas celebrated his graduation. <laughs> There were plenty of reasons to stay, and the beer was flowing freely. But Thomas's thoughts kept drifting up the Danube, then did an abrupt turn and landed on the river March. He had decided to follow the flight of his thoughts and do what he'd done in the nights before and would continue to do in those that followed. Here he was, the only student in the world to celebrate his graduation with a beaver. This was the night when it finally became clear that Thomas Hulik was possessed. Thomas may have been bitten by the beaver bug, but he was far from being crazy. For after 100 nights in the swamp, he achieved something that no one before him had done. He came to within an arm's length of a wild beaver. For a biologist, such a degree of trust was of priceless value. Only in autumn do passers-by suddenly realize 
that beavers have moved into the neighborhood. The beaver's tree felling has mainly to do with laying in victuals for the winter. Their aim is to get at the skin of the tender branches in the tree's crowns. Their industrious tree felling habit clears a lot of space and promotes the typical fast growing types of trees. Bare spots, thickets, and sparse undergrowth disappear altogether. The very things that drive foresters to despair are a blessing for the wetlands. Rachel prepares her fur for the winter. She is carefully cleaning and rubbing her coat of hair with the gland secretion to make sure that no drop of water can penetrate it. The March Riverine Forest is small, and yet a place of extremes. In summer, the thermometer rises to 40 degrees centigrade, and in winter, it drops to 20 degrees below zero. I vividly remember a very cold afternoon in winter. There was absolute stillness in the wetlands, and I was photographing beaver tracks. I was totally confused at first, but then I realized it was a gang of youths, illegal refugees, running from the police. Tragedies like this are always happening in the March wetlands. Refugees are brought to the border by illegal traffickers, but when they try to cross over into Austria, they get caught and are left stripped of both their money and their hopes. Beavers do not hibernate. On the contrary, in winter they do a kind of fitness workout, dragging half the forest back and forth. Rachel is not splashing about for fun. She is constantly breaking the ice to make sure it doesn't freeze over the hole. This is imperative, as the only entrance to the lodge is below the surface. Winter reveals a well-kept secret. Rachel's young emerge for the first time. They were born in May, and now they're about half as big as their mother, but still as playful as little children. Beavers can swim in icy water for hours. Their fur is incredibly dense. 15,000 hairs per square centimeter. It guarantees complete water and cold resistance. The young beavers have a lot to learn, about thin ice, for instance, and how much weight it can bear.
The first signs of spring are already evident in the beaver forest. A large shoal of young fish seeks the protection of a fallen tree. Unfortunately, the hiding place is known to some predators too. This pike is in his element. These bleaks hatched a short while ago and will soon flit through the old tributaries into the river. Of thousands, only a few will survive as they figure well down in the animal breadline pecking order. With the arrival of the first migratory birds, the snow melts and one bad weather front follows another. There's no dam to hold the march on the Slovakian side, and so floods occur regularly in spring. In the spring of 2002, the floods in the beaver domain rose uncommonly high and stayed menacingly for a very long time. But the beavers didn't suffer unduly, for they had retired to dens that Rachel had prepared on higher ground for this very eventuality. The floods and the swift currents left their marks. And not always just stacks of reeds, unfortunately. Now spring can make its entrance. On the Austrian side of the march, right across from Rachel's territory, the storks have returned from their winter quarters in Africa. On the perimeter of the town of Marcheg, only a few hundred meters from the beavers, is the largest stork colony in Europe, judging by the number of visible nests anyway. Some 100 birds gather here every year. Now Rachel again began showing herself during the day. Thomas Hulick noticed some days before that something in her behavior had changed. And one morning, Thomas's suspicions were confirmed. While watching Rachel wash herself, he saw clearly that her teats were swollen. So she was either pregnant or had given birth already. She was resolutely fetching branches and small trees to the lodge, and Thomas assumed that she was redecorating. This time, Tom was determined not to be tricked. He just had to see her young, so he stuck to Rachel's heels. I saw that she always swam towards the same group of trees and then submerged. There was a bed of chewed reeds that looked very like camouflage. I was standing on the roof of Rachel's new house. Then came a moment I shall never forget.
Rachel was home with the baby at her breast. The young were a week old at the most. At first I could only see two, but then I heard more calls and squeals coming from the back of the nest. Now it was clear why Rachel had been behaving so oddly. She ate like a horse day and night. She had to keep her strength up, of course, as the babies constantly demanded more and more milk. But Thomas was surprised by the size of her appetite nevertheless. Just how many babies did she have to feed? A few days later I made out three babies in the nest, which is nothing unusual for beavers, but I suspected there were even more. What really surprised me was that Rachel allowed me to get so close to her and her young. My presence didn't seem to disturb her at all. Beaver babies need a lot of care and attention, especially during the first few weeks. Only when the long beard hairs have grown over the woolly fur does their coat become really watertight. And they can't swim right away either, so they have to practice in their indoor pool. So long as they drink only milk, Rachel never has a free minute. They begin to eat green stuff when they're four weeks old and are weaned at eight weeks. Then Rachel can begin teaching them to swim and dive in the big pool too, if everything goes well. The tributaries become a bird's paradise in early summer. Ducks, grey and silver herons, storks, and occasionally even black storks all gather here for breakfast in the dawning hours. It slowly dawned on me that Rachel was a very peculiar beaver indeed. Normally the beaver young from the previous litter, the one-year-olds and the father too, help rear the new babies, but they were nowhere to be seen. In the whole domain there was only one adult beaver, Rachel. Meanwhile, I had spent around 1,000 nights in the wetlands. I still had to approach her with care, but Rachel clearly regarded me as part of the furniture. Here we see the legendary beaver teeth at work. The front enamel is hard and the inner one soft, and it wears down continually. So in fact, the teeth sharpen themselves while biting. How many photos had I already taken of her? 5,000? 10,000? I'd lost count. Meanwhile, Hulik had taken down hundreds of pages of scientific observations and facts, written dozens of essays and articles. 
He was still under 30, but he had already advanced to being a leading expert on beavers. And yet things continued to happen that surprised me. Sometimes Rachel was unusually shy, and then again, one day she even allowed me to touch her. Day after day, Rachel dragged big branches into the water, chewed them into small pieces, and lined her den with them. Inside, there was now a non-stop show in progress. This litter was really something. At last I was able to count. There were five of them. Only very seldom do beavers have so many babies. Thomas was thrilled. Never before had anyone taken such pictures. But he had no way of knowing that these happy days in the swamp were numbered. In midsummer 2002, Dark thunderstorms suddenly gathered over the country, and then it just never stopped raining. For weeks, there was not even a chink of blue sky. Central Europe was inundated by once-in-a-century floods. The last time Tom saw Rachel, she was moving with her brood, heading for higher ground, he supposed. The little village of Devinska Novovej on the River March was now flooded for the second time in a year, and the high water mark reached a new record. Alone in the region surrounding the beaver territory, hundreds of people lost their entire belongings. Dozens of houses collapsed or were ruined forever. At 
the height of the flood, Tom paddled through the wetlands with his friend and colleague Fyodor, looking for the beavers. Rachel's domain was now six meters underwater, together with the higher dens and nests. The young were still not able to swim properly. Their only chance was the elevated railway embankment. But there was nothing but water, water everywhere, and not a sign of the beavers. By mid-August, the floods had receded and Thomas Hulik continued his search for the beavers untiringly. He had already seen Rachel. She must have kept to the embankment during the floods. But where were the young? Hadn't one of them at least survived? In the forest, not even a distant splash was to be heard. Soon, even the very last trace of the recent catastrophe had disappeared in the wetlands. Thomas was unable to enjoy the late summer idyll, however. Day after day, he continued his search with Fyodor and refused to believe that five little beavers had all been drowned. Then another small miracle happened. At the back of a remote tributary, I suddenly saw a movement near the bank. Two of them had indeed come through. They were strongly built and showed not the least fear. Just how Rachel managed to rescue them, though, would remain a mystery forever. Beavers become self-sufficient quite quickly. As soon as they can swim and dive, they find their own food and check out the domain by themselves. They stay close to their mother, but live and sleep mostly alone in their own dens. Just like their parents, they take up their work as master builders, never stop adapting and renovating their quarters. The young depend to a large degree on their siblings for survival. 
Nothing is more important than the care lavished on each other's fur, the joy in each other's company, and the general delight in common games. Meanwhile, the little wetlands forest on the River March has become a picture book beaver paradise. Wherever one looks, there are dams and water buildups, and consequently, there is also a colorful variety of flora and fauna. Felled dead trees nurture new life and serve to feed countless types of insects. Thomas Hulik has been studying beaver language for some years already. While listening to them, Tom discovered that they were quite loquacious. They have a whole repertoire of calls and greetings and farewells, the young ones in particular. In the meantime, Thomas has identified some 20 different sounds. These two have not the slightest interest in exchanging information at the moment, however. It becomes apparent that beavers have excellent hearing, but bad eyesight. During the month of September, summer begins to wane and a fantastic spectacle takes place, the stag rut. Two magnificent specimens standing peacefully next to each other. For this to happen during the rut is incredible for the contest is held to decide who will be the next king after all. Around this time, the beavers are very busy too. It's time to go wood chopping. The starlings take up artistic formations for the flight home. While the last summer guests are departing the scene, Rachel resumes her work. In several stages, the trees are stripped and gnawed all round. Legend has it that the trees are always felled in expert fashion towards the water, but this may be wishful thinking. Fact is that beavers invariably fell trees growing next to the water. The gnawing and felling, dismantling and dragging takes the whole night. Rachel is no longer alone. The two one-year-olds have come back to the fold.
Now the united beaver family attacks the trees together. What exactly is Tom up to after these 1,001 dramatic nights in the swamp? I'd like to know where the male goes after the mating. It's as though the earth opens and swallows him up. And I'd also like to know where the young of the previous years have gone. Rachel chased them off and where the next lot will go to. There are already three, no, four generations. We ought to fit them out with radius, and we should make another beaver film, bigger and better than ever before. We should get under the eye.